Welcome to Hamilton Community Church. We want to welcome you here, even our online families. We, we're just so blessed that you chose to worship with us on this Sabbath. You know, what happened behind me, I mentioned this earlier. My son went to CA. He got to play in the band, but I've seen a side of CA's band and orchestra that I've never seen before. Amen? I mean, like, wow. You know, I mean, it was good, but we just stepped it up 12 more notches, and I mean, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed worshiping this morning. You know, I'm in the back or doing something in the front, but I got a chance to experience worship, and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, you know, CA's, I have a history with CA. You know, my son went to, he graduated after four years, and, and for many years, I maintained the equipment for CA, um, for the grounds, you know, with Mr. Um, Crawford. But now I get an opportunity to, to minister back, in a way, and just sit here. You know, this month is pastor's appreciation, and I can't go past without bringing that up again, because I'm not a pastor. Our pastor's in um, Colorado looking for a home, but I've Pastor um, Tim Cross was here, and I see my longtime pastor, Dr. Brzee. I remember the conversation we had over 20 years ago when he asked me to be an elder, and those words still resonate in my heart. And he's sitting next to his father, Pastor Brzee as well. I mean, we have a lot of great pastors in this place. I'm not sure if Andy's here, but we're spoiled at Hamilton. I've been here this December be 24 years, and I only had two senior pastors. I'm spoiled, and I had great pastors, even great associate pastors. But one thing I have learned over the years, I can't do what they do. I have to be me. And that's the one of the conversations that Dr. Brzee had with me in Florida. Be you. That's why we ask you to be you. So while we're here and experiencing God's presence in his word, this is pastor appreciation. Hug that pastor. Kiss that pastor. We got baskets at the thing where you can contribute some monetary gifts for the pastor. But they need to be poured in as well. They need to be showed love because they pour into us every week. Now, off time, on time, it's all the time. They're there for us. Let's keep that in mind. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you and just praise you that we can come and be at your feet. And we allow us to be poured into by you. Regardless of how we walked into this building, Allow us to experience your Holy Spirit. As we worship, now we get to worship and to hear it in truth. May the words come alive in us. Let it become flesh to our bones. Forgive us for our shortcomings, our doubts, our fears. Remove anything that would keep us from hearing you, the distractions of this world. Not interfere in this time. Let this be a time of decoration to, be, to declare all things is possible through you. Allow me to speak clearly. Allow me to be me. Allow you to make me, mold me, and speak for you this morning, I pray. Amen. You know, when I was going through the motions of what I was going to say, and then this just hit me. When you're growing up, we all played the playground, right? The social network of that day, us older people, we didn't have a social network like you have here. We would play these games. Do y'all remember that old legendary game, Duck, Duck, Goose? Great, what? I was, a, I was a little guy, believe it or not. I was a little guy. I loved that game because I know I can catch that person. But then I would see the faces of the kids who couldn't. So that word goose was not a good word. That was a bad word. For me, it brought me joy. For others, it brought pain and suffering. Because I remember those kids who could not, and they would always, always lose. And see, in that social network of the playground, we learn a lot of good things and bad things. Good, wrong, everything. But in that process of that simple game, it was showing us how words matter. And it's little lies that we've been taught our whole life. We all built with cliches, okay? That's just who we are. I don't know because we're American. I know being black and my wife is Spanish, we use a lot of cliches, a lot. So that's just, it's part of our culture. I'm sure it's growing, maybe it's just an American thing, but cliches is who we are. And I remember this one cliche that I would always hear, sticks and stones 
may break your bones, but what? Words would never hurt you. Ain't that the biggest lie? I grew up like an armor. My mom was like, I always say this kind of things, you know, the words don't hurt you, but don't let, you t- don't let anybody touch you. So I kind of had this motto that I had in myself, and I taught my boys, words are words, but don't let anybody put their hands on you. Because I grew up little. I had to do a lot of fighting when I was young. I was a fighter. I, I hate to lose. I had two older brothers that beat me. Oh, they beat me. And it made me who I was, who I am now. I became faster and stronger because I had to run for my life (laughs) because it was my fault. I did a lot of things. But in that journey, words became real. And I realized even today's society, especially for our young people, that is the biggest lie that words will not hurt you. Because one of the biggest threats to our society was social media, people choosing to unalive themselves because of words. Words that were spoken. Words on a digital platform, on a phone or their computer. Words matter. And here's the other cliche that we like to say, you know. It, it's just, it matters. There is life and death in our tongue. That's one thing I heard all my life. But when you go to the words of Proverbs 18:21, the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap its consequences. Other translations said reap gifts of fruit. You know, those, that's telling us automatically that when we choose our words, we have to choose them wisely. And it's going to affect someone if it doesn't affect you. You know, when I was thinking of um, some situation that was going on here at the church for the past three months, you know, of course, Losing Pastor Keith and losing Pastor Dave, and then we got a new nominating committee. Everything is changing. My son, in a week and a half, is going to be sent to um, 50 miles outside Russia to train soldiers to fight. You know, he was supposed to have been dropped in Palestine, but that changed. A lot was going on in my house. I have a son in Germany. He started a business, and things are uncertain over there. So, a lot of emotional things, and I, I was feeling oppressed. And then every month, I get to have a phone conversation with uh, some great guys. One of them is um, Pastor Jerry Page. He was a former conference president. And after our call, we had a, a personal call. And he shared with me some things. And he shared this scripture of Psalm 64. We know about King David. Everybody knows about King David. He was the men of men. He was afraid of no one. He was that guy. If you want to put that in perspective in today's society, I'm not going to say, forgive me for my words. I was told we should not apologize when we're giving the gospel. But I've worked with kids for over 20 years. I only worked with adults for this past two years. So sometimes I kind of get excited and use some slang. So if you hear some words that you may not understand, say something, I'll give you a translation. You know, because David had Riz. Riz is where they say charisma. Girls just love David. Imagine he was here today. He would roll up into a town, and everybody started dropping bars. The ladies would start singing in the kids. Who is this guy? They singing about a guy? What's up with that? He's that guy? Fearless. They sing that, that the king dropped hundreds, but David dropped, dropped thousands. He's telling kids today, why are you playing Xbox, Call of Duty, Fortnite? I was slain in the fields. Why are you sitting in front of a computer? I lived that life. That's who King David was. That's the memory we have of him. But when you read Psalm 64, it gives you a different picture of who King David is. Let's read those words and see what was going on in the life of King David. Psalm 64, verse 1, O God, listen to my complaint. Protect my life from my enemy's threats. Hide me from the plots of those evil mobs. For this game of wrongdoers, they sharpen their tongue like a sword. 
They aim their bitter words like arrows. They shoot from they shoot from ambush at the innocent and attack the sudden and fearless. They encourage each others to do evil. They plan how to set their traps in secret. Who would ever notice? They ask. As they plot their crimes and they say, we had devised a perfect plan. Yes, the human heart, the mind is cunning. See, when Pastor Page, he gave me that scripture and, you know, I read it, I read it. And it was starting to break me to realize how real King David actually was. It wasn't just the words that he was hearing. It was the people he was hearing it from. You can hear things every day, but that one person can break you with those same exact words. What is that? Why is that? This man would stand in front of thousands and destroy them. Why? One man's voice broke him. Why? It's okay to be broken. It's okay to allow things to break you only if you go to the ones who can make it new. And that's to Jesus. When that time, God. We have to go to God. We have to go to the Word. We have cliches every day. But when you don't apply those cliches in real terms, other words, when you go through life challenges, cliches take on a whole nother meaning. It becomes flesh to your bones. It's not just words. But see, Words are words, but you start giving it some flesh and bone, it's powerful. He cried out to God in that moment. He had to choose. He made a choice. He's a fighter. He is bona fide. He will take you out. Why this time he chose not to fight? The Bible says we're not battling against flesh and blood, right? A lot of our battles is in our mind. He was broken. In the cliche, Ephesians 3, verse 1, you know, we always say there's a time and a place for everything. Have y'all heard that from your grandparents when you want to go play and do something? But it's Sabbath. You can't do that. So that, those words don't quite feel good. But in the context of this, if you read it from the scriptures, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under the sun. There is a time to stand your ground and fight or to break. There's a time that you need to speak or not speak. But there's always a time to let God work. That should be our number one choice. Allow him to guide us. But in that moment, King David chose God's version to work in his heart. Because see, the battle of the mind and our heart, the spirit of the word is very seductive and deceiving. The enemy is very constantly you know, trying to pull our eyes off Jesus every moment. Our strength alone is not going to get us there. No matter how strong or cunning you are, how smart, how good looking. I'm not that guy. But I see people very good looking. They get a lot of things in life. But that only gets you so far. It only gets you so far. And King David knew it. Because remember, he can have anybody he wanted. He can take you out. But he chose God for his support, his strength. Again, biblical cliches take on a whole nother meaning when you're going through something. Black, my wife's Hispanic, we say a lot of cliches. My, my son was having a conversation with his new friend, and they were saying how, why do black people say, you know, I'm hungry, but I'm not hungry, hungry. A few words, but it has a lot of meaning in that. You know, or I'm good. Depends how you, if you're looking at them, you know what that good means. It could be good, good, or well, I'm just good. But in the context of what I was experiencing here lately, I was broke at first, but I wasn't broke, broke. Yeah. 
Some people are laughing, but when you have kids, when you say, I was broke, but I'm not broke, broke, that means you got to put something aside because, you know, bad days about to happen. You better have something on the side because kids will have a way of taking that broke, broke to a whole nother level. And I always tell my boys, it's not going to be an ER day today. You need to simmer down, you know. But that's, that's those kind of words that happen. And over these three months of dealing with, you know, taking on a new task here at church, the pastor's leaving, nominating committee, I was feeling a lot of emotion. And things was being said. Even I was having a conversation with the young drummer. He remembered me from many, many months ago when I was on a cane. You know, I got to have both knees total replacement. Plus, I did it right before COVID, and COVID said, nope, I'm not going to the hospital today. I'm not going to be trapped there. God has sustained me for these three years without having total knee surgery. And I'm walking without a cane. He was like, oh, I remember you had that sweet cane. That, I'm like, yeah, yeah. I don't need it no more, that walking stick. But it was nice. I didn't want to be that guy walking around with that stick. But God has sustained me. And I felt attacks because of my health, and I couldn't understand why. I was broken. Have you ever been in so much pain spiritually that your body reacted and your body was in pain? I was starting to go back to those pains of injuries. Things was going on that day. I made it through the first service, barely. But when I re Thinking these things, I have better clarity. I came into the kitchen one night. It was the lowest of all the days this past few weeks, where before I would wake up in the middle of the night, can't sleep. You know, we listen to music, we read things. I brought out my old DJ software. I was trying to make some Christian beats, you know, DJ Pastor Pete. Trying to give joy. I was losing my joy. Reading the scriptures, nothing was breaking my spirit. Then I heard a, pod, a podcast of two ex-Navy SEALs out of, the, out of the woods. Not what you think would be a good spiritual insight with clarity into my soul. And these guys was talking. These guys kill people for a living. But they've gone through some things. They've been broken, and then they're sharing their experience. And he guy was saying how he hated when his commander would always say, we didn't get the money, we didn't get the approval, good. And he'd say, well, make him mad. We deserve that equipment, good. He said, why do you keep saying good? That means I got to improve something. There's something we need to work on to get that equipment, to get that approval, good. When I first heard that, my life changed three weeks ago. So my new motto was, it's good. All things work. Count it joy. Count everything as joy. You're getting accused of this. Count everything as joy. You can't do that. Count everything as joy. I kept telling myself that. I would wake up in so much pain and spiritually, physically, mentally, that I would wake up singing a song. This is how God works. My wife would end up singing that same song throughout the day. We're like, you like that song? Yeah, yeah. I don't know why I was thinking about that song. God was working in our marriage, in our lives. We was getting healing in ways that we didn't think about. But when I sat in that kitchen that night, I sat down and I just broke. I was broke, broke. Every thought, every movement was painful. Every instance, I thought I just had tears. I could not stop crying. It was painful. And I kept telling myself, count his joy. So what did I do? Let me just read the scripture for itself. Stop just saying the cliche. And once I opened up James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, and I read these words in that kitchen, sitting in the only chair in there, and something happened. It said, dear brothers and sisters, when trouble of any kind come your way, consider that opportunity of great joy. What does that mean? I'm in pain. I've been saying these words, but what does that mean? I kept reading. 
For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance gets a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when endurance is full, uh, developed, you will be perfect, complete, needing nothing. Did you know in that moment, something broke in me. The pain went away. The tears stopped dropping. Joy came to my heart. I didn't work around the church. Didn't think about any of this drama. None of it. Before I got out of that chair, it was like an out-of-body experience. God took me back in a point of 20-something years ago. My son was just born. I was working at a manufacturer making computer boards in Peachtree City, Georgia. Knew nothing about that type of industry. We had a restaurant. I wanted to leave. I wanted to do something different. We needed good, insur good insurance. You know, I'm starting a family. And they had great benefits. So I worked for this little company. It was the largest privately owned manufacturer of circuit boards. They make stuff for cell phones, Intel. I had the opportunity to make the first four-layer Intel circuit board back in those days, which is not a big deal now. And I, they started a new division. So I was greener than green. And God took me back to that moment when I started working there, knowing nothing. Working third shift. And everyody knows third shift is kind of like the, not even a stepchild. You, you below a stepchild. No one really cares about third shift workers in a company. First shift, yeah. Second shift, stepchildren. But third shift, eh. We worked on skeleton crew every night. We had a supervisor, great guy. He taught me a lot. But a lot of times he wasn't there, he wouldn't show up. That's a whole nother, that's part two of this sermon. But in that struggle, I had to learn some things. I figured out how to work six days a week, get paid for eight and a half days working for this company. Ask me, I'll tell you how you can do that. As an Adventist. And I did that. So I started working in different departments in this company every chance I got. Because I want to know how we make a circuit board. I want to know why in this room there's millions of dollars worth of circuit boards that's going to be thrown in a dumpster. I worked in the clean room. If you ever know the clean room, that's the room where you wear a Tyvek suit. From the time you walk in, you covered, you only can see your eyes because everything matters. One speck of dust can destroy circuitry when you're making it. And I had the opportunity to run that room not really being trained. I didn't have the title. I don't care about titles. I just wanted to get the job done. My supervisor was non-existent. We didn't have a lead in that room. And each piece of equipment was worth a million dollars. Can you believe that? That was 20-something years ago that made circuit boards. And this was a new style that was going on. So a lot of experimental things was going on in that room. And the maintenance guys was always coming in. Stuff was breaking. You know, imagine every day you had the opportunity to make a million dollars plus of circuitry. Sometimes I would have a three by four with a red tag. That one little thing was a million dollars in itself if I can make it that day. And now a lot of stuff was Intel. Um, a lot of experimental things that you see now, we was making that back then. And it was top secret. And we would make these boards. And so when I was learning these different processes, you know, most of you don't know, there's actually gold in circuit boards. We did that process. And I knew I had the opportunity to work with these people and seeing how the process was going. We would start out with a, a copper line, 10 millimeters. Do the process, every process takes off a meal. So if you get one piece of dust or lint on that circuitry, we print the image onto a platform, goes through a process, and that's when you get the lines. It's crazy how simple it is, but how complex at the same time. And we'll have one piece of lint, and the ladies and gentlemen will say, you know what, that took off two meals. Some people just trash that. It's no good. I had a problem with that. Why things had to be thrown away? I wanted to know more, so I learned all these departments. And then I realized there's two more departments that's going to take off. So that eight is now going to be a six. That would pass final inspection. 
That would pass in the heat of the battle. That's a surgical equipment. That's a cell phone. That's something to be in the field. It will pass. Have you opened something up and has numbers like version A, P7, section A? That's like a timestamp. They know when that was made. So a lot of things you may have may have my numbers on it, and I let it go through. But see, I knew I had to let some stuff go through because I knew the process. If you know the journey, if you know the end of something, it helps you in the beginning. So while I was going through this, first shift was like scrapping all this stuff. You know, we can't send it out. Second shift was doing I would go in and, and evaluate it and say, let's send it. And I got in trouble for that many times. But then the end, like, the, the engineer's like, oh, it's perfectly fine. Then through that process, you know, the maintenance guys would come in, some break down. They would fly people in from Japan. That line that's worth, see, one line was like three, four million dollars. One line that we ran equipment through would sit there empty for a week, waiting for someone to fly in from Japan. So what did I do? I started observing what they was doing to that equipment, watching the maintenance guys. I figured out a way to take a little, you know, those little plastic containers that you put your sandwich or your pencils and pounds pins in when you go to school. I don't know should they do it now, but that's something we had when I was growing up. I figured out how I can get enough little tools that I can bring into this clean room that will stay clean instead of having these big old two bags, the guys with the back pocket with the clear bottle with stuff in it, you know what they do. Maintenance guys, they, it is what it is. And I started doing maintenance on these machines. Imagine these machines have uh, very high-tech cameras. There's a, there's an image that's projected, and these cameras lines it up with the boards, with the hose are drilled. It has to be precise. And I realized every time we open and close these doors, the cameras get jolted just a little bit, and it would throw off the cameras. So I would readjust those cameras. I thought it was no big deal. Got the lines going. We're producing. First you come in, I'm in trouble again. Why I got this line running? So I had to go through interrogations. I would, I couldn't take lunch breaks. I didn't go to the bathroom. I was trying to be the guy to get everything going. Big mistake. I learned a valuable lesson in that. And after I got interrogated, God spoke to me. He said, if you fight for your life, you'll lose it. If you give up your life, you will gain it. Everybody know that? That's just one of those cliches we hear. And I took that to heart. So I went back into the room, and I started teaching everybody everything I knew. From the person from the beginning in my room to the end. Everything. I want to know every technique. I want to know the end result. We had one young lady from Griffin, Georgia. Loved her to death. Sweet. My wife, we, we laughed when I was talking about her. Because she just had to, I'm, I'm country, but she was country, country. Country. And she's like, oh, Mr. Patrick, I sawed it up. I was like, what? I sawed it up. Oh, you mean you set up the machine? Yeah. And I taught her how to look for the defects. How did this here? And she came alive. I never seen someone grow so quick. The whole department grew. We outproduced first shift, and we had a skeleton crew. Do you think that made me look good? Nope, I got in more trouble. But I took my first lunch break, sitting in the break room. This little old lady came up to me, and she said, I heard about a young man. That must be you. I'm used to getting in trouble, so like, what do I do now? And she spoke life into me. She encouraged me. When I was broken, thinking, what can I do for this company? I'm still getting blamed. I left that lunch. And as I was going, you hear that term, a little birdie said this. I can't tell you if that was a human person or the voice of God. Something told me, transfer out this company now. So I went to the job board. Looked for the one department that nobody wanted to go to. I'm in the cleanest room in this department, in this company, I chose to go to waste treatment. That's the dirtiest part of this company. Everything nasty goes through waste treatment. Anything spilled, waste treatment comes and get it. So I transferred. 
Can you believe my transfer happened so fast? Before that week was out, I was out that department. It was unheard of. And immediately what happened after that? The company laid out 1,200 people that day. And guess what department got hit the most? The one I just left from. That little birdie was saying they was gunning for you. The one department that nobody got laid off? Waste treatment. And I'm here working in the dirtiest. I wish I could paint a, a picture for you how nasty this department was. Going from the cleanest to the nastiest. Part two of what breaks you. I'm going to talk about that experience. But in that experience, God taught me to trust in him. When you're going through some things, those cliches mean something. It was flesh and bones. I knew I had to trust God. And I left that place in power. So all this mess I was going through, he brought to my, it was like a time castle opened up. God was like, yep, you went to that for a reason. Then he asked, what do I do now? Cliches mean a lot. But if you don't take these things and apply it to your life and allow God to work, this is how, working with kids for all these years, I would tell them, you know, yea, I walk to the valley of death, I fear no evil. Thou rod, that staff, that comfort me. That's what we hear, right? What does that mean today? Yea, I walked through my math class at third period when the mean girls are sitting to the left. They would not affect me. I am beautiful, wonderfully made. I am a child of God. Speak those words in your mind. Speak those words into your soul. Because see, until you apply these things, it means absolutely nothing. I don't care if you read the Bible five times. If you can't apply it to your life, it's useless. That book is just something getting dusty. But when you apply it to your life, it is power. And the devil knows that. And I realize these experiences is what Revelation talks about. What's going to stand? The word of God and the word of our what? Testimony. So we go through these journeys for a reason to share with our brothers and sisters, not to keep it to ourselves. If I hold on to things in my hand, it is useless. I don't care how much skill I have until I let this out of my hand. My hand cannot do nothing for this world. Nothing. If I hold on to guilt, regret, anger, pain, suffering, all it's doing is affecting me. But if I let it go and give it to God, God can use that to help others. Because he used that pain in others to help me. I'm not here by chance. I'm not here because I decided to move back to Chattanooga. I said, I'll never come back ever again. Ever. Never say never. Because that never is going to be instant regret. But I'm here. I'm used to working with kids. For two years, I got to work with adults. That is an amazing experience. If you always work with adults, you need to work with kids. It would change your world. Can you believe just working with kids all these years have changed my perspective on things? It's amazing. They don't care. They don't care. When I start realizing, I don't have to worry about what people say about me. What's what God says about me? That's what matters. What did the Word say about me? I'm more than a conqueror. So when I, you, you find yourself going to work and Sally and accountant is just being difficult, and you can look at her in your spirit and say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. You're not going to try to hold me on some clerical stuff. You can look at your boss and look him dead in the face. In your spirit, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am a child of God. I'm more than a conqueror. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice in it, even though you say I got to work over it. Even though you deny me of that raise, I'm still a child of God. That's when the scriptures come alive. That's why I love what's about to happen here soon. On November 11th, I hate I'm not going to be here. I'm on a Pathfinder trip. 
a day of worship. And what is the slogan for that day of worship? Nothing is impossible. Do you believe that? That's one of them cliches. Is it really true? I can do all things through Christ? Until you apply these things, yes, it's useless. So I invite you to come out that day and just worship God. Worship is powerful. When you find worship with your journey and your journey back to worship, intertwine in the word of God and allow God to speak to you, you come out differently than when you went into it. I'm, first service was hard. I was trying not to cry the whole time I was speaking. But I kept reading the words over and over and over before I came out. It's amazing how that strength. Then I heard last night, if you read your Bible more than four days a week, how it would change your life. Just that simple. The gospel is so simple, but we, comp- we make it over I can't even say the words. You know what I'm talking about. I get my son's names wrong, so it's okay. It's okay. It is what it is. But I want us to leave this room changed in the spirit, allowing God to pour into us, even though you don't see the light in the tunnel, even though you feel the knife room still sticking to you, trust in him because you are not alone. Bring it to a close. I know I did a lot of talking, but I'm, I'm closing it up because I know God is still working in our lives. I know he's working in mine. I am not perfect. Lord have mercy. I got in trouble last night with my wife, and I still don't know what I did. But it's okay. It is what it is, right? But I'm here today, and I can look at her. She's smiling. My lovely wife goes, yeah, that's my boo. But I, didn't, I couldn't have made this journey alone. That's why he puts people in our lives to take this journey with us. Sometimes we carry luggage. Sometimes baggage. But this is why the cross is there. You can leave your junk at the cross. You can leave your bags of trash, your burdens, your pains, your tears. What's that word it said? My burden is, burden is easy? Well, I just said, I just messed that up. Lord, have mercy. Come to me, all who are burdened. I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. So easy to say, even though I messed it up. But it's so easy to do. So I challenge you today. Leave it to God. Give it to him. He's standing right there. Yay, I stand the door and knock. We heard that word all our lives. Are we going to really open the door? Sometimes that door is right here in our heart. If we really believe it. Little man smiling. Thank you, brother. I needed that. You gave me encouragement. Yeah. Some of the, it's little things we see that gives us encouragement. We all look for the big things. I learned those small things really matters. A hug from Mama D. That's my highlight on Sabbath. Get my vitamin D from Mama D. She's smiling. I did it. But that's what life is. That's why we have Cornelia here in church. We gather together to be a family. Dysfunctional, but we are family. So I'm going to close with this one saying. No matter what we go through, We are not alone. He will make a way for us if we only trust in him. But he has to be with us on that journey. So the question was, you decide what breaks you. But when you choose, who are you going to choose to fix you? That is the question. You know, now it's time I want to close with prayer. And I just want to offer the altar. If you feel, you know, I've been holding on this this regret. I've been holding this anger, pain. I've been hating this sister for 12 years. I don't know why. I don't even remember anymore. Now is the time to let it go. You've been mad at your pastor for 25 years because he preached on this subject and he never gave you clarity. You can let it go. 
You can come to the altar and say, here I am, Lord. Naked, afraid, vulnerable. I let it go. You can ask for forgiveness for the wrong you may have done to someone. Or you can just forgive someone who doesn't even know you, they have harmed you. That's what coming to the cross is all about. And I don't want us to leave this place without the opportunity to go before God and say, I'm sorry. Go before our Father and say, I'm broken. I need you. I was lied to. I need you. I was deceived. I was blind. But now I see. I need you. So I'll offer the altar. If you want to come, have prayer. If you want to we have elders here. We have um, very spiritual people who will pray with you. You know, you can come forward or sit to the side. But I want to close with a prayer that we can just know that we're not alone. That no matter what we see in this world, especially in the Middle East, we've heard these rumors of war of end time. Now we're seeing things unfold right in front of us. Who are we going to believe? Who are we going to trust? Who is going to put the pieces together? I only know one person. Do you know him? I ask you, if you don't know him, ask him into your life today. Ask him to be that one for you. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father. We thank you. We praise you. We can come before you right now. We offer our fruits. We offer our talents, our gifts, and the youth worshiping us today. We lay down our burdens. We lay down our fears, our tears, our joy, our suffering, our lives. We pray that you would make us whole. We pray that you would renew our mind and our spirit. It will put the pieces together. Let the fractures of this world continue to grow, but grow in you. Father, don't let anyone leave this building without saying yes to your will if they don't know you. I plead the blood of their lives. I pray for our children and our children's children. Pray for our soldiers, our families far and near. I pray for our co workers, our spouses church members, our pastors, our political figures. We need you more than ever. For such a time as this, that we can go before you and declare victory over our lives. Declare healing, a peace that passes all understanding for those who need it. Send someone comforting to these people who need you. Thank you for sending people to my life for encouraging words. Thank you for healing my brokenness. Thank you for healing the brokenness in my family right now. The brokenness in those in the sound of my voice. They know there's a living Savior. Thank you for choosing death to give us life. That we can stand before you to know out a shadow of our doubt that you are Lord and Savior, King of kings, the Alpha and Omega. Thank you, Jesus. As we join together and leave this place, let us leave this place saying amen, amen, and amen. God bless. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, You can be confident of one thing, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day Jesus Christ returns. Here at Hamilton, we exist to connect the disconnected by sharing Jesus through loving and serving and being a grace-filled church family. When you walk through our doors, we want you to feel right at home. It's our intention to make worship attractive and Christ irresistible. 
Good morning, welcome. Good morning, welcome to Children's Church. Good morning, welcome to Hamilton. Our service is about to start. Come join us now, it's time to worship. <laughs> 